having us come in today to uh, be with you and talk about Brown versus the Board of Education and our part in that historic case. And reminisce with me some 50 years ago when my family became part of Brown versus the Board of Education. It all started for me on a balmy day in the fall of 1950 in the quiet Kansas town of Topeka when a mild-mannered black man took his plump seven-year-old daughter by the hand and walked briskly four blocks from their home to the all-white school and tried without success to enroll his child. The child of whom I speak was I, Linda Carroll Brown, and my father, the late Reverend Oliver Leon Brown. Black parents in Topeka felt that the day of trying to enroll their children in the school nearest to their home was long overdue. Many were the evenings my father would arrive home to find my mother almost in tears because I would get halfway to the school bus stop, which was a seven block walk from my home. I could only make half that walk because the cold would get too bitter for a small child to bear. I can still remember starting that bitter walk and the terrible cold that would cause my tears to freeze upon my face. I would return running as fast as I could. I had to cross a very busy avenue in order to catch the school bus, which would carry me more than two miles across town to the all-black Monroe Public School. These were the circumstances which so angered black parents. My father pondered why. Why should our children have to travel so far to school, facing unbearable winter weather, waiting for a badly overcrowded school bus to carry them some two miles across town when there is a school only four blocks from our home? Why? Why must I have to spend time trying to explain to my child that she cannot go to school with her neighborhood playmates, who are predominantly white, Native American, and Hispanic, because her skin is black. In the face of this discouragement, he, along with 12 other parents, met with the local NAACP and their lawyer, Charles S. Scott, a local attorney, to make plans for each family to try and enroll their child in the white school nearest their home during September 1950. After trying enrollment and being turned down, a suit was filed in federal court in February of 1951. During the following July, the federal three-judge panel heard testimony from my father, along with several of the other parents, who agreed that segregated schools for blacks were unequal. I, along with my father, had to appear in court, but unlike him, I was not asked to appear on the witness stand. The case was argued before a three-judge federal court in Topeka and was decided in favor of the Board of Education and its segregated elementary schools. In Topeka, the issue was not so much integrating public schools to improve the quality of instruction, but rather the inaccessibility of the neighborhood schools. Black people were able to live all over town, but could not expect to send their children to the schools closest to their home. At the Supreme Court level, the case was consolidated with similar cases and argued in terms of the psychological damage brought about by segregation in public education. Experts from the psychiatric community were pulled in to examine whether or not segregation, in fact, served to break a youngster's morale and block the development of a strong, positive, self-concept so essential to educational progress. My family became lost in the turmoil of the ensuing years, years that scarcely touched us. We lived in the calm of the hurricane's eye, gazing out at the storm around us and wondering how it would all end. I don't think my father ever got discouraged, but at this particular time, neither I nor my parents 
knew how far-reaching this suit would become. During the next three years, while the now famous decision was in the making, my father was called into the ministry. He received a charge in the fall of 1953, and the family moved to the northern part of the city, where we became the first family of the St. Mark AME Church. I was transferred to the all-black McKinley Elementary School in North Topeka, again facing the same situation of having to walk twice the distance it would have taken me to reach the all-white school just three blocks from my home. Time stood still as the highest court of the land pondered over Brown versus Board of Education until an afternoon in May of 1954 when I was in school, my father at work, and my mother at home doing the family ironing and listening to the radio. At 12.52 p.m., the announcement came. The court's decision on ending segregation was unanimous. My mother was overwhelmed. On returning from school, I learned of the decision, which at that time meant only to me that my sisters wouldn't have to walk so far to school the next fall. That evening in our home was much rejoicing. I remember seeing tears of joy in the eyes of my father as he embraced us repeating, thanks be unto God. That night, the family attended a rally given by the local NAACP and held at the Monroe Public School. The following school term was so very different, but not for me, because I was never to benefit from the now famous decision. For during the 54 school term, I entered junior high school, which was already on an integrated basis, as were the high schools in the city. Integration in the city in the fall of 1954 went very smoothly. It seemed as though blacks and whites had been going to school together for years. Neither I nor my family suffered the abuse or racial strife that marked integration in the latter 50s and early 60s in so many parts of the country. We were very fortunate, my father would often say. He believed very strongly that God would move people to do the right thing. The latter 50s found my family living in Springfield, Missouri, where my father held the pastorate of Benton Avenue AME Church. At this time, newspapers and magazines began to do follow-ups on me and my family because the significance of the Supreme Court decision which carried our name was beginning to really take hold throughout the country. It was during this time that I inherited much of the recognition that might have gone to my father had it not been for his untimely death in 1961 at the age of 42. If he had lived, I'm sure he would have become a strong civil rights activist in the movements of the 60s. Little did he know that years ago, when he stepped off the witness stand, he stepped into the pages of history. I didn't understand what was happening then, but it was clear that Brown versus the Board of Education was a necessary victory. It might have been a little flame, but it served to set off a mighty flame. To me, the impact of Brown is best seen in the increasing numbers of black professionals today. These are the people that after 1954 were able to have some degree of choice. This surely made a difference in their aspirations and their achievements. I ran across a quote in a new book by one of our black women authors, and her name is Mildred Pitts Walters, that I believe says it all. It is not the treatment of a people that degrades them, but their acceptance of it. Thank you.